As far as the ecumenists are concerned, qui autem scandalizaverit unum de pusilis istis, qui in me credunt, expedite ut et suspendatur mola asinaria in coloeus, et demergatur in profundis maris. That's Matthew 18, 6. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. To that, amen to that. That's the words of our Lord on the modernists. Matthew 5:18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall not in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. And in the same Gospel of St. John, our Lord says, Sanct Sanctify them through thy truth. Yesterday, somebody whom I don't want to mention complained to me that I'm too harsh and that I fight. I do our Lord's will. Non veni pacem mitere sed gladium. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. And that today is a 50 caliber machine gun, not a sword anymore. <laughs> As Father Paul Kramer mentioned today in his conference already, in, uh, towards the end of the 18th century, there was a so-called Synod of Pistoia going on. In uh, 1786, a rather daring, Leopold II, Archduke of Tuscany, sent a letter to all the bishops in the area requesting reforms in the church. Well, I have said uh, everything that had to be said, and Father Paul Kramer has said everything that had to be said about reforms in the church, so I don't, want to have, I don't have to repeat that. Anyway, in 1786, a couple of bishops got together and came up with uh, 84 theses that were uh, worked out into large documents uh, requesting reforms within the church. Because of political difficulties, and when I say political difficulties, I don't mean that at that time the pope was a coward. Pius VI was not a coward, he was a heroic pope. But he was in really big trouble, but that's uh, another story for a lesson on history. So because of that, it was it needed until 1794 that the proposals of the Synod of Pistoia were for, for, uh, formally, formally and solemnly condemned by Pius VI. In the introduction to his document, unfortunately I don't have an English translation of the document, so I have to quote by memory. Uh, don't shoot me if I make a mistake. Um, in the introduction to his document, he says that the, the reformers, he still calls them the reformers, the liberals, the liberal reformers uh, hide their intentions behind uh, a duplicity of language, behind ambiguous terms. They deliberately use weak terms, ambiguous terms, and incomprehensible terms to hide their real intentions. Now, uh, here's one thing that's very important. Most of the papal encyclicals are written to the bishops. All, as a matter of fact, all of the, the papal encyclicals that I quoted yesterday were written by the Pope addressed to all the bishops. So he's straightening out, trying to straighten out the bishops, and he tells the bishops what they have to do. Now, it's very important to, note, to notice that uh, Octorum Fide in 1794 was addressed to all of the faithful. So what Pius VI says in this document is not only ordinary teaching, but it's directly addressed towards the faithful of the Catholic Church. And it tells them, he says literally, the praise of a synod is in clarifying the terms, not in coming up with ambiguous terms. That means without knowing what would happen in 1962 following, Pius VI in Octorum Fide already condemned Vatican II 
that is jam-packed with ambiguous terms, ridiculous terms, new speak, and heresies and blasphemies and errors. Uh, very soon I'm going to register a video in Los Angeles where I will tear apart Vatican II and put it where it belongs, in the trash can. And uh, thank you. <laughs> so the problem, of ref uh, the problem of the reformers was something very well known already to Pius VI. However, it needed until the days of Pius X to have a brilliant, thorough, and excellent analysis of their real way of thinking. See, many of you have read Vatican II at least in part. I'm probably one of the few priests who has studied Vatican II every single line at least four times over. And believe me, it's a great nuisance to do so, but it has to be done. And uh, this very contradiction between uh, what Pius VI demands of a synod or a council and between what Vatican II actually did has a root. Now, as we will see at the end, I'm not taking away the punchline because you know it anyway, uh, as we will see at the end, the actual root of reforms usually is pride, nothing else. Vainglory and pride and stupidity. As you always said, pride and stupidity are twin sisters anyway. But uh, we have to go through a methodical analysis of the actual roots of modernism. And nobody has done it better than Pius X in his document on the doctrines of the modernist, Pascendi Dominici Gregis, encyclical letter of Pope Pius X. You can find that with the Angelus Press. And I recommend to everybody of you to get this document. Now, it is a difficult document. You will find it difficult reading. It's also uh, the only uh, long document that Pius X ever wrote. Now, in those days, popes were precise and to the point. They did not overindulge in endless blah blah like the present pope does. But Pius X's Pascendi Dominici Gregis is a very long and lengthy document. However, if you find the time and uh, keeping the uh, Catholic Family News article that will reproduce my speech today, it is worthwhile to study this document because you really penetrate the heart and the core of modernism with this. And even the excellent books that came out after Vatican II and tried to, to, to analyze the root for the mess uh, always had to quote Pope Pius X with this document. That's the reason why I'm going to give you a, an abbreviated and an, an, an analytical reading of this document. I will proceed just in the same order that Pius X wrote it. That might be less entertaining, but uh, it will be a lot more precise. Pius X, first of all, uh, explains the duty of the Apostolic See. Then he talks about the necessity of immediate action. Why? Because in those days, as a matter of fact, as a repetition of what had been said and requested at the uh, false synod of Pistoia, which sometimes is called the synod of robbers, il synodo dei ladroni, that means uh, an unauthentic, non-approved, therefore illegal synod. In number three, he talks about the characteristics of the modernist. I quote, Although they expressed their astonishment that we should number them amongst the enemies of the church, no one will be reasonably surprised that we should do so if leaving out of account the internal disposition of the soul, this is what I said yesterday, you can never pronounce a personal judgment on anybody. We are judging facts. We are judging quotations and we are judging decisions. If leaving out of account the internal disposition of the soul, of which God alone is the judge, he considered their tenets, their manner of speech, and their action. So he calls them the enemies of the church. We are not discussing here if they want to be enemies of the church, as I said. They are the enemies of the church. Then he talks about the previous attempts by the modernists that have failed. He's talking about the Synod of Pistoia and what happened during the 19th century. He indirectly is also referring thus to uh, the Americanist heresy, 
which has been condemned by Leo XIII in 1899. And then he comes to talk about the modernist personality. I quote, The modernist sustains and includes within himself a manifold personality. He is a philosopher, a believer, a theologian, a historian, a critic, an apologist, and a reformer. You will find, if you uh, waste your time watching TV discussions, as I have done in the past but don't do anymore, that the, the modernists are absolute and total know-it-alls. They know everything. God knows the rest. They know everything. They meddle within every single subject that could possibly concern the church. They know how to organize a parish. They know how to teach philosophy. They know how to teach theology. They know how to interpret the scriptures, and of course they know much better than any pope ever what the dogma really means. These people assume an authority that is not even given to the pope himself. The root, the philosophical root, of uh, their attitudes is indeed, and that might come as a surprise to you, because we're talking about agnostic sect today, it's the conciliar church being agnostic sect. But the real root is agnosticism. We begin then with the philosopher modernists, place the foundation of religious philosophy in that doctrine which is commonly called agnosticism. According to this teaching, human reason is confined entirely within the field of phenomena, appearances. That is to say, to things that appear and in the manner in which they appear. This is the philosophical root of the writings of John Paul II. The phenomenal, phenomenologists are distinguished from uh, the, the healthy and sound philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas in uh, being the contradictory, contradictory uh, assessment of reality. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas says, a thing is what it is, and a thing cannot, cannot, be and not be at the same time. One and the same thing either is or is not. This is what I explained yesterday when I was talking about act and potency. There are three stages of being. Non-being at all, being in potency, being in act. See, in act I'm a priest. In potency I'm a pope. But in no way am I a mother. And uh, this is an assessment of reality that will uh, appeal to the common sense that God has given us. And if you see a car passing, you will say this is a car. Either it is a car or it's not a car. But it will not depend on its being car on what you think. The phenomenologists say it's your decision. It is what it is, appears to you. And this is what I call subjectivism. Because uh, you look at an orange and you say, because you don't like it, you say, this is not an orange, this is trash. But it doesn't change the fact that it is an orange. And if you use a beautiful Tuscany flower vase as ashtray, it doesn't become an ashtray. It's still a flower vase abused as ashtray. It doesn't become an ashtray. But according to the phenomenologist, it is just what you use it for. Pure subjectivism. There's no objective truth anymore. And this is exactly why Pope John Paul II believes that you can be saved in other religions. All you have to have is your feeling for the truth. For what truth? Your feeling for being good and nice. And uh, this is uh, a result, this subjectivism is a result of the modernists' belief in what uh, St. Pius X, who has read some of the worst modernist authors, calls... Uh, vital immanence, the positive part of this uh, agnosticism, consists in what they call vital immanence. That will be a, an explanation for that, will be sought in vain outside of man himself. It must therefore be looked for in man. You see what I'm getting to? When people talk to you about uh, experiences of faith, they do not talk anymore about having read a dogma or a doctrine they will tell you this is just an experience of faith that I shared. So they're looking, instead of looking at objective facts on the outside, 
They look into their own religious feelings. And this is what they call the vital immanence. Immanence means it's remaining within you. It's a sort of vital principle that comes from your inside. Something which uh, actually for those who are interested in philosophy, that's exactly what the Stoics thought. This is what uh, the beautiful old emperor Marcus Aurelius thought. Well, Marcus Aurelius was not a Christian. It must therefore be looked for in man. And since religion is a form of life, the explanation must certainly be found in the life of man. In this way is formulated the principle of religious immanence. You see, it's in man. It's not the objective revelation coming from God. It is not tradition handed down from generation to generation in the church, from pope to pope in the church. No, it is all within ourselves. You see, this is the root for the blasphemous statement in Gaudium et Spes of Vatican II, number 12, where it says, believers and non-believers alike agree with the fact that all the church's efforts are directed towards man. Where's the greater glory of God? It's within us, within ourselves. This is what they think and this is what they teach. When the Jesuits were still Catholics in the old days, their uh, coat of arms said, Ad maiorem Dei Gloriam, to the greater glory of God. And the motto of my code, of my personal coat of arms is, Omnia ad maiorem Dei Gloriam, everything to the greater glory of God. So when uh, Gaudium et Spes talks about the efforts of the churches being directed towards man, it is pronouncing blasphemy because it is substituting God with man, for which you will find innumerable other examples on my video that is to still up to come, God willing. And this is why they say a revelation for them is at the same time of God and from God. That is to say, God is both the revealer and the revealed. And uh, if we look for this revelation within ourselves, then we are revealing ourselves to us. Does that sound absurd enough? Well, Gaudium et Space number 22 says so. For in his becoming man, Christ has revealed man to himself. Gaudium et Space 22. And the Pope quotes this a couple of dozen times in his encyclicals and letters and whatever else, else he writes. The Pope has a, a, a disconcerting habit of concentrating his quotations on the worst parts of Vatican II. And uh, because man is really revealing himself to himself, we have what St. Pius X calls the religious consciousness and uh, in, uh, regarding the religious consciousness and faith from this venerable brethren. He's talking to the bishops in this encyclical, as I said before. From this venerable brethren springs that most absurd tenet of the modernists that every religion, according to the different aspect under which it is viewed, must be considered as both natural and supernatural. It is thus that they make consciousness and revelation synonymous. Consciousness means my being aware of what is revealed and revelation meaning what is revealed. So uh, my being aware of revelation is actual revelation to me. That means I don't need the church uh, handing over a dogma to me. I have it within me anyway. Which is the explanation why they believe that all religions lead towards God including the voodoo mag magicians in, so in South Africa, to whom John Paul II, he was addressing Satanists, to whom John Paul II was, praise, was giving praise on religious liberty, as if he was talking to a, an acceptable and respectable religion. Now get this, the present Pope is calling Satanism indirectly an acceptable and respectable religion 
that falls under the paragraph of, of, of liberty of religions proclaimed by Vatican II. From this they derive the, the law laid down as the universal standard according to which religious consciousness is to be put on an equal footing with revelation. You see? What I feel inside is equal to revelation. Do you understand now how it is possible that they say that uh, tradition is improved and will grow with our experiences and our studies? Yes, of course, if we are the ones who reveal the truth to ourselves, sure we can improve tradition. And that is, it, uh, it must all submit, even the supreme authority of the church, with, it, excuse me, and that to it all must submit, even the supreme authority of the church, whether in the capacity of teacher or in that of legislator, in the province or of sacred liturgy and discipline. That means what I feel is right. And if I feel that the new Mass is beautiful and right, then the new Mass is beautiful and right, period. This is total religious anarchy. It is speeding by far and going by far beyond all the Protestant teachings we've ever had. It is thus that the religious sense, which through the agency of vital immanence, emerges from the lurking places of the subconsciousness. Ah, oh, there is God already. It is the germ of all religion and the explanation of everything that has been, over, has been or ever will be in any religion. This sense, which was first only rudimentary and almost formless, under the influence of that mysterious principle from which it originated, gradually matured with the progress of hum human life. See that? Gradually it matured. The source of our religion is gradually maturing of which, as has been said, it is a certain form. This, then, is the origin of all, even of supernatural religion. For religions are mere development of this religious sense. This is the explanation on why not only you can be saved in all the religions, as they say, but this is the reason why we are searching for the truth. I'm not searching for the truth. I have it. Here, Den Sänger Schönmetz, a collection of papal documents and dogmas. I got the truth in this book. I'm not searching for it. Nor is the Catholic religion an exception. It is quite on a level with the rest. This is why we have to be ecumenical. And all these ecumenical activities with the Protestant and the Eastern churches is because if you can be saved in them, within these religions, and because of these religions, then why convert? This is exactly why missionary activities today are dead. And when recently uh, uh, a bishop of the Ukrainian Catholic Church, uh, John Venari was telling you this story, wanted to convert, he was turned down by Rome. And as Bishop uh, Tissier de Malaret said very well, if we call the... Uh, as the, the, the Balamance Agreement and the Vatican do, if we call the Ukrainian Church the daughter of the Russian Orthodox Church, and the Russian Orthodox Church is our sister church, then we, maybe we are the end of the uh, Ukrainian Church, and this is our niece. You see the absurdity of what they are saying? They call a Catholic United Church the daughter of a heretical and schismatical church, which is the, the Russian Orthodox Church. How is that possible? Where is the logic? Well, the logic is here. You can be saved in all religions. This process of vital immanence and by no, uh, in, in the consciousness of Christ, who was a man of the choicest nature, whose like has never been nor will be. The consciousness of Christ. And... Uh, in Ecclesiam Suam, Paul VI talks a uh, hundred times over about the consciousness of the Church. I told you yesterday that in his uh, first encyclical, which is a programmatic encyclical as always, John Paul II, in his encyclical Redemptor Hominis, does not once, not even once, 
mentioned the term Catholic Church or Roman Catholic. Oh, he talks about the Church of the Council. He talks about the Church of the New Advent. Yesterday I heard somebody saying that it was my term. God forbid. I use the terms that the Concilia Church gives to itself. The Church of the New Advent. And he talks in one and the same paragraph, in one and the same paragraph, six times over, about the consciousness of the Church. The Church is deepening, maturing, approaching truth in its consciousness. You see that? The Church is not the perfect society anymore. Matter of fact, canon law calls it a society. Canon law does not use the term perfect anymore. The Church is the pilgrim church on earth. On a pilgrimage towards truth, the Church is maturing in its growth of tradition because of the maturing consciousness of the Church. The consciousness of the Church is deepening. You see the absurdities I'm saying here? This is what they teach. But uh, Vatican I said, and this is Catholic doctrine now for change. If anyone says that man cannot be raised by God to a knowledge and perfection which surpasses nature, but if he can and should by his own efforts and by a constant development attain finally to the possession of all truth and good, let him be accursed. This is what Vatican II said about the idea that we are capable of arriving at the truth without revelation. Now the same Vatican once said, the only thing we can recognize by the light of our reason is the existence of God. But if anybody says that you can arrive at the understanding of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, just using your reason, let him be accursed. And uh, because of this constantly growing consciousness of the church that comes from the consciousness of the people, that comes from the principle of vital immanence, and that comes from our steadily growing subconsciousness, our religious experiences, and our religious and emotional, they don't call it emotional, but it is, of course, emotional development, we have an evolution of dogma. Dogma is not only able, but ought to evolve and to be changed. You remember what I said yesterday about those who attempt to change dogma. Let them be accursed. This is strongly affirmed by the modernists and clearly flows from their principles, for among the chief points of their teaching is the following, which they deduce from the principle of vital immanence, namely, that religious formulas, if they are to be really religious and not merely intellectual speculations, ought to be living and to live the life of the religious sense. This is the origin of the request for the stupid concept of a living tradition that Vatican II has been propagating and that the Pope quotes in the Ecclesia Day. In other words, St. Pius X says, in other words, it is necessary that the primitive formula be accepted and sanctioned by the heart. And similarly, the subsequent work from which are brought forth the secondary formulas must proceed under the guidance of the heart. The Holy Spirit is not mentioned here, just the guidance of our heart. Hence it comes that these formulas, in order to be living, should be and should remain adapted to the faith and to, he, to him who believes. This is why you don't have to care about the crumbs falling off a host at communion in the hand, because Christ is there anyway only for those who believe, as Herr Dr. Martin Luther said. Wherefore, if for any reason this adaptation should cease to exist, they lose their first meaning and accordingly need to be changed. So if the times change, dogma changes. Some things have been acceptable to the 18th century. They might not be acceptable to the 20th century, so let's change the meaning. Because otherwise, how could our poor subconsciousness and our consciousness and our religious experience and our feelings get along with it? This is why almost all the bishops today are telling young girls, if they feel like doing it, let them have a, a, a artificial contraception. Only the Pope still is hanging on to the old doctrine. It's because you have to find yourself, you have to realize yourself. And you have to develop your subconsciousness, and you have to deepen your spiritual, 
you're uh, religious and you're supernatural, which of course they don't distinguish from a natural, experiences. In other words, wherefore, for any, if for any reason this adaptation should cease to exist, they lose their first meaning and accordingly need to be changed. In view of the fact that the character and lot of dogmatic formulas are so unstable, it is no wonder that modernists should regard them so lightly and in such open disrespect and have no consideration or praise for anything but the religious sense and for the religious life. How is it possible that, ecumenically speaking, we put the Protestants on the same level with us? Well, because, why, listen, uh, the, first of all, uh, it's rude to talk about religion and politics. Don't offend the Protestants. See, we can talk, the, we can share our beautiful religious experiences with them, and we can talk about the things that we share and the things we have in common. You think I'm making fun? No, I'm quoting our Pope. In his directory of ecumenism, when he says we should underline the common the things we have in common. That means forget about all the dogmas they don't accept. Forget about real presence in the Eucharist. Forget about the real priesthood of priests. Forget about uh, one religion only that can save. Forget about everything the Protestants don't like. And remain with what we share in our religious feelings. This is what St. Pius X analyzes the downfall of tradition. For what is laid down as to experience is also applied with destructive effect to tradition, which has always been maintained by the Catholic Church. Tradition is understood by the modernists is a communication with others of an original experience through preaching by means of the intellectual formula. To this formula, in addition to its representative value, they attribute a species of suggestive efficacy, which acts firstly in the believer by stimulating the religious sense. You see, it's talking about religious sense stimulation. This is all equal to emotion. It's a whole subjective emotional uh, tohu wabohu of dogma and lie, which are not distinguished anymore. Should it happen to have grown sluggish, that religious sense, and by renewing the experience once acquired and secondly in those who do not yet believe by awakening in them for the first time the religious sense and producing the experience. In this way is religious experience spread abroad among the nations, and not merely among contemporaries by preaching, but among future generations both by books, by oral transmission from one to another. So tradition is not anymore the transmission of the content of Holy Scriptures and from what has been handed down from us to us uh, after the death of the last apostle when Revelation was concluded, it is not anymore the transmission of what the apostles heard out of the mouth of Christ and what the popes laid down through the centuries, but it is an accumulation of individual subjective experiences. Sometimes this communication of religious experience takes root and thrives at other times it withers at once and dies. For the modernists to live is a proof of truth, since for them life and truth are one and the same thing. Thus we are once more led to infer that all existing religions are equally true, for otherwise they would not survive. That goes to show you that the most true of all religions is Buddhism. It's going back uh, to 500 years before Christ. And probably the truest of all religions then is Islam because it's certainly the one with most, with most membership, with the highest membership. So, okay, women among you, forget you have a soul. You don't have one, according to the Koran. But, uh, funnily enough, the Pope never mentions that fact. He talks about women's rights. He allowed all the girls, and at the same time he praises Islam and the Koran. He dared to call the Koran a holy book. The Pope of the Roman Church the Holy Father, the Bishop of Bishops, had the audacity to call the Koran, in which it says that the infidels must be killed and women have no souls, he called that a holy book. Now, as far as the methods of the modernists are concerned, St. Pius X says, in their writings and addresses, they seem not unfrequently 
to advocate doctrines which are contrary one to the other. Does that ring a bell after you read Vatican II? So that one would be disposed to regard their attitude as double and doubtful. But this is done deliberately and advisedly, and the reason of it is to be found in their opinion as to the mutual separation of science and faith. That's one of the oldest problems in Christianity. Uh, just recently the Pope has dared to reconcile Galileo Galilei with the Church. Galileo Galilei was not condemned because he said that the earth revolves around the sun. Galileo Galilei was condemned to silence because he dared to say that modern science proves the book of Genesis wrong. You see, uh, Pope Barberini, Urban VIII, the one who gave me my privilege, thank him for that, uh, he made, he discovered uh, the completely unknown Galileo Galilei and appointed him to the chair of mathematics and physics at the University of Bologna. Now, at the University of Bologna, which in those days all universities were Catholic, uh, Galileo Galilei was supposed to teach mathematics and physics. No, he didn't do that. He taught in class that the book of Genesis is wrong because mathematics and physics prove that uh, creation was something different from what the book of Genesis says. So Rome called him and said, shut up. But instead of remaining silent, he wrote a little booklet which uh, was a trilogue. Three people discussing the arguments uh, of the astronomic system. Either Earth as a center or, soul, uh, or, or the Sun as the center. And uh, in his book, he, gave, he, he, he ran down the arguments of Cardinal Barberini, who by now was Pope the Ur Urban VIII. He ran them down, and uh, he sort of uh, made them appear even more primitive than they were. And the guy who has to speak that part in his trilogue was called Semplice. In those days in Italian, Semplice is simple. Uh, that was equivalent of calling him an idiot. So, of course, uh, in an indirect way, he called the Pope an idiot in public. So Urban VIII, who was a nice and good person, instead of killing Galilei, he just told Galilei to shut up forever on whatever subject. And this is how all those fairy tales came up, with Galilei having said, and she still rotates. And uh, nowadays, of course, in this... Uh, renewed contradiction of science and faith, the present Pope has nothing better to do but to reconcile Galileo Galilei, who was an impertinent blasphemer with the Church. That's why it says here, and the reason of it is to be found in their opinion as to the mutual separation of science and faith. This was condemned already at the time of St. Thomas Aquinas when a certain uh, 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 philosopher in Strasbourg uh, William Ockham and uh, I forgot the other name now came up with the idea that there can be two different truths at the same time. Something might be true in theology and then it might, be, it might not be true in philosophy. Some other things might be true in philosophy out of the viewpoint of philosophy but will not be true out of the viewpoint of theology. Oh, C.J. of Brabant was his name by the way. And St. Thomas of Aquinas dealt with him in a much more friendly way than I would have and settled the problem forever when he said, if a truth in philosophy does not correspond to a truth in, in theology, then it's just simply wrong, period. The one in philosophy. Thus, in their books, one finds some things which might well be approved by, as a Catholics, as, by, uh, uh, by a Catholic, but on turning over the page, one is confronted by other things which might well have been dictated by a rationalist. Now, uh, the modernists on the church. The concept, the conception that the church is autocratic, that means that the church governs itself and is not uh, under the influence uh, of state, has not, has, must not be governed by the states or even less by the laity. This conception has now grown obsolete. For in the same way as the church is a vital emanation of the collectivity of consciences, this is what I said before, all of our individual consciences and subconsciousnesses and our religious experiences build the church. They, on that, the church is growing. 
We are the fundament of the church, not God. This collecti- the, the, the vital emanation of the collectivity of consciences, so too authority emanates vitally from the church itself, not from Christ. You know as Catholics that the church is the mystical bride of Christ, and like in a good marriage, where wife will be subject to husband, the church is subject to Christ. But not for the modernists. Authority, therefore, like the church, has its origin in the religious conscience, and that being so is subject to it. Should it disown this dependence, it becomes a tyranny. For we are living in an age when the sense of liberty has reached its highest development. In the civil order, the public conscience has introduced popular government. <laughs> Don't we know that? Now there is in man only one conscience, just as there is only one life. It is for the ecclesiastical authority, therefore, to adopt a democratic form unless it wishes to provoke and foment an intestine intestine conflict in the consciences of mankind. The penalty of refusal is disaster. So uh, what the Republic did in 1789 and what the French uh, Revolution did in 1789, now they are wanting to see in the church. And they have succeeded. They have succeeded. There is the principle of collegiality that you find in Lumen Gentium. There is all the bishops' conferences, there is all the synods, there is all the the parish councils, the bishops' councils, the priests' councils. It's the Soviet church. The word Soviet means council. So you have a parish Soviet, you have a diocesan Soviet, you have a national bishops' conference Soviet, and you have the synod in Rome, which is a Soviet, of course, it's a, it has become a bureaucratic hierarchy of Soviets. And considering that uh, 95% of the bishops are far out uh, liberal leftists, we have a socialist Soviet Republic instead of the old church. Sovietskaya, Socialistitskaya, Katolika, Respublika. Bonanotte. That explains why the church and the state has to be se- have to be separated. You know that that doctrine has been condemned by Gregory the Sixteenth in Mirari Vos. It has been condemned by Pius the Ninth, by Pius the Leo the Thirteenth, by Pius the Tenth, by Pius the Eleventh, by Pius the Twelfth. John the Twenty Third wanted it. Paul the Sixth wanted it. John Paul the First wanted it, and John Paul the Second is practicing it. Pius the Tenth knew that in 1907. The state must therefore be separated from the church and the Catholic from the citizen. Every Catholic, from the fact that he is also a citizen, has the right and the duty to work for the common good in the way he thinks best, without troubling himself about the authority of the Church, without paying any heed to its wishes, its counsels, its orders, nay, even in spite of its rebukes. For the Church to trace out and prescribe prescribe for the citizen any line of action, on any pretext whatsoever, is to be guilty of an abuse of authority against which one is bound to protest with all one's might. Venerable brethren, the principles from which these doctrines spring have been solemnly condemned by our predecessor, Pius VI, in his apostolic constitution, Octorum Fide. You know what Dignitatis Humanae says in Vatican II? The state does not have the right to impede other religions from practicing publicly. That's in Vatican II. And that's a sentence that has been explicitly condemned by Pius IX in his Syllabus of Errors. Now, back to tradition and progress. Pope Pius X understands that the future is going to show that although evolution is urged on by needs of necessities, yet if controlled by these alone, it would easily overstep the boundaries of tradition and thus separated from its primitive vital principle would make for ruin instead of progress. Hence, by those who study more closely the ideas of the modernists, evolution is described as a resultant from the conflict of two forces, one of them tending towards progress, the other towards conservation. This, by the way, and it is in the edition I got, page 34, remember that. Page 34 in the Angelos print uh, uh, edition of uh, Pascendi Dominici Gregis, number 27. 
This is the most, impa most important of all the paragraphs of the whole document. This is the demasking, the unmasking of the Opus Dei. It is the unmasking of all the so-called conservative forces in the conciliar church. It is the total unmasking of Cardinal Ratzinger. It is the unmasking of the Commission Ecclesia Dei. Evolutionists, listen very carefully. Evolution is described as a resultant from the conflict of two forces, one of them tending towards progress, the other towards conservation. The conserving force exists in the church and is found in tradition. Tradition is represented by religious authority, and this both by right and in fact. By right, for it is in the very nature of authority to protect tradition. So it's not because it's coming from God, but because it needs each other. And in fact, since authority, raised as it is above the contingencies of life, feels hardly, or not at all, the spurs of progress. The progressive force, on the contrary, which responds to the inner needs, the inner needs, lies in the individual consciences and works in them especially in such of them as are in more close and intimate contact with life. You heard about the bases knowing everything and the bureaucrats up there knowing nothing? Talking about the church, mind you, not Washington. Well, there it is true, eh? You heard about that, right? So, as they are more close and intimate and in intimate contact with life, they know it. Already we observe, venerable brethren, the introduction of that most pernicious doctrine which would make of the laity the factor of progress in the church. Now it is by a species of covenant and compromise between these two forces of conservation and progress, that is to say between authority and individual consciences, that changes and advance, advances take place. So if anybody calls me a conservative, watch out. In politics, I'm a die-hard Republican and conservative. In religion, I am not a conservative, I'm a Catholic. I've never been a progressive, I've never been a conservative. Because you see, this is the Marxist principle of dialectics. You create discussion, and with that discussion, you bury everything else. The church does not discuss. The church does not dialogue. The church teaches, period. And Christ said, who can take it, take it. Who is capere potest capiat. If not, go to hell, as the Irish say. You don't want it, you lost. I will come back to this paragraph before I conclude a little bit late, but this is very important. The modernist as a reformer wishes philosophy to be reformed, especially in the ecclesiastical seminaries. They wish the scholastic philosophy to be relegated to the history of philosophy and to be classed among absolute systems. They desire the reform of theology, rational theology, is to have modern philosophy for its foundation and positive theology is to be founded on the history of dogma. This is exactly the thinking of our present Pope. He's grown up with the wrong philosophy of phenomenologism and he's stuck to it. He does not understand the Thomistic system of theology that has been explicitly approved by the Holy Office under St. Pius X in 1910. Dogmas and their evolution, they affirm, are to be harmonized with science and history. This is why we have to adapt to present circumstances. Regarding worship, they say the number of external devotions is to be reduced and steps must be taken to prevent their further increase. Well, that happened, didn't it? All the processions are gone, all the devotions are gone, and we just say hi to each other and shake hands for a Sunday worship together. The rest of the encyclical talks about methods of healing the great problem. And uh, before I conclude this with another quotation that will uh, offend many of our enemies, I go back to the progressive and the conservatives. I read again. Hence, by those who study more closely the ideas of the modernists, evolution is described as a resultant from the conflict of two forces. 
So Cardinal Ratzinger is the, the conservative who believes in authority, therefore affirms everything the Pope says, and wants everybody else to think the same way. But at the same time, he does not condemn anybody, except Lefebvre. And then we have the laity as the basis of the church. They are the people out in real life. They are the ones to know what our consciousness and our conscience needs. So only if those two forces are in dialogue, the conservatives who know all the rules, who are the sticklers to paragraphs, who are the sticklers to canons and rubrics, only if they dialogue with the simple people, the laity who know everything because they are out there in real life, not behind the closed walls of a monastery where you can't know anything, only if they dialogue, changes and advances can take place. Now, St. Pius X here condemns the idea of the laity as the basis of the church. A certain so-called blessed Jose Marie Escrivá de Balaguer, founder of the Opus Dei, sees the base basis of the church in the laity. He said so, and I'm quoting uh, books by Jose Maria Escrivá de Balaguer, not by all the many enemies of the Opus Dei. Can somebody who taught something that was against what St. Pius X teaches in this encyclical be canonized? Well, rest assured, in the Church of the New Advent, everything is possible. I'm not discussing the fact if poor Jose Maria Escrivá de Balaguer is in heaven or not. I don't have any problem with seeing him in heaven. But we are talking about the object, objective beatification and canonization of somebody whose life has to be in correspondence with what uh, tradition demands of somebody to be canonized. Jose Maria Escrivá de Balaguer always insisted on the laity. He, call, he speaks about the vocation of the laity. There is no such thing. Anything you as lay people are called to, you're called to by priests. If not, it's not a vocation. I asked you yesterday to stick to your sensus fidelium and to stand up against the church of the new advent. So a priest told you to do so, and inasmuch as I have the right to tell you so, and inasmuch as I am right in telling you so, you have, therefore, a vocation to do that given to you by me, as a simple and humble instrument of God, the source of all vocation. But there is no such thing as a vocation of the laity itself. But the so-called blessed, Jose Maria Escrivá de Balaguer says so, St. Pius X, I read that line again. St. Pius X says, Now, venerable brethren, here we see the introduction of that most pernicious doctrine, some people complain about my being explicit. Pernicious doctrine in 1910 was a very strong term, which would make of the laity the factor of progress in the church. Now, for the modernists, progress is everything, so the laity is the basis of everything. And to conclude this speech, I'm going to read Pius X's opinion on how these horrible doctrines can come about. But it is pride which exercises an incomparably greater sway over the soul to blind it and lead it into error. And pride sits in modernism as in its own house, finding sustenance everywhere in its doctrines and lurking in every aspect. It is pride which fills modernists with that self-assurance by which they consider themselves and pose as the rule for all. It is pride which puffs them up with that vain glory which allows them to regard themselves as the sole possessors of knowledge and makes them say, elated and inflated with presumption, we are not as the rest of men, and which, lest they should seem as other men, leads them to embrace and to devise novelties even to the most absurd kind. 
It is pride which rouses in them the spirit of disobedience and causes them to demand a compromise between authority and liberty. It is owing to their pride that they seek to be the reformers of others while they forget to reform themselves, and that they are found to be utterly wanting in respect for authority, even for the supreme authority. Truly, there is no road which leads so directly and so quickly to modernism as pride. When a Catholic layman or a priest forgets the precept of the Christian life which obliges us to renounce ourselves, if we would follow Christ and neglects to tear pride from his heart, then it is he who most of all is fully ripe subject to the errors of modernism. For this reason, venerable brethren, it will be your first duty to resist such victims of pride, to employ them only in the lowest and obscurest offices. The higher they try to rise, the lower let them be placed so that the lowliness of their position may limit their power of causing damage. Examine most carefully your young clerics by yourselves and by the directors of your seminaries, and when you find the spirit of pride among them, reject them without compunction from the priesthood. Would to God that this had always been done with the vigilance and constancy which, constancy which were required. Amen.